Hi friends, welcome to our Sunday podcast. I'm Pastor Ken with Faith Dialogue. Um, this is our podcast, both video as well as audio, called Prophecy Countdown. Uh, we provide two updates every single week, one on Sunday and one on Wednesday. Um, now on Sundays, we're going through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Our, our, today, my, my, my message is, is Jesus promises true rest to the believers, and we'll be in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Matthew. We try to go through gospel, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Uh, and that premieres on 1 o'clock on, on Sundays. On Wednesdays, if you tune, tune in the rest of the week, our updates are always prophecy related. And typically, the, the topics we cover come from you, uh, the viewer and the listener, those that subscribe and share and watch our videos and, our, and our pod, our, our listen to our audio podcasts. Uh, we love answering your questions. If you have a question, send it into prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. That's prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. I personally answer every single email that comes in, regardless of what the question is, as long as it's prophecy related. In fact, if, as long as it's scripture related, I'm going to try to give you an answer, the best answer I possibly can. Um, and then again, we take those, those questions and that becomes the topic of our podcast. We've got enough questions now to go for another three or four weeks, so be sure to send in your questions and, and we'll get to them. Because if you have a question, most likely others do as well. Now today is our Sunday podcast. Uh, the topic of my lesson today is from chapter 11 of Matthew and the topic is called, or my title is called, Jesus Promises True Rest to the Believers. Let me read it to you, beginning in verse 25 of chapter 11. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, in this section of Scripture, we see Jesus revealing this unique and very special relationship that he had with his Father, the God the Son, had with God the Father, these, these, two, these two persons of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. And they had this very unique and very, very special uh, relationship. You know, mystery is part of the revelation that we see Jesus in his relationship with his Father. But notice that Jesus says this. He says, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and no one to whom the Son wills it to him. You know, this is, this is the thing about Jesus and the Father. They had this plan to be able to redeem the human race before, uh, before the foundation of the earth. Th this was a plan that God had. And he, he had you in mind, and He had me in mind, and He had the people in mind that would come to Him through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever Jesus spoke of His relationship with His Father, it was always through the lens of, of joy. We also get a glimpse of the continuous communication through prayer and just daily communication between the Father and Son. And we see it in this verse as well. And you might have missed it. A lot of people miss it. It's through the word answered. In the New King James, as well as most of the translation, it says this. It says, Jesus answered and said. Well, well, who did he answer? We take a look at the scripture and we don't see any question being asked. Well, the person that Jesus is answering is, is his Father. He and his father are in communication. So as he begins this discussion with his disciples and sharing this message with the people around him, including you and I by extension, he starts off by saying, uh, Jesus answering saying, thank you, Father. He's in communication with his father. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. What a wonderful way to start. Jesus is in communion with his Father. Constant communication. You know, Paul said that we are to be continuously in prayer. And I think this is an example of how Jesus was continually in prayer, speaking to his, his Father. Now, this is interesting because 
it, it's obvious that there is a, a, a plan of a plan that's being revealed, and Jesus says that it's being revealed, revealed to the babes. Did you get that? So the question is, who are the babes? Well, in the context of the New Testament, this word is used a number of times. And it's specifically in, regarding the teachings of Jesus. The people who respond to the message are the babes. Uh, some of them are disciples, followers, and individual, uh, individuals who hear the message, and then they respond to it. They respond to Jesus, whether it's follow me, commit no more sin, or, or, or go and sin no more, for example. These people come from various walks of life including fishermen, tax collectors, common people. You know, the Apostle Paul even makes the comment regarding to, uh, the believers. He says this, he says, maybe this includes you and me, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And this is the, the idea of, of how the gospel is being revealed. And who is it being revealed to? Well, it's being revealed to those who respond. But often, as Paul says, these people that it's being revealed to are not the famous, are not the strong, are not the worldly. They are the, the babes in Christ. The, God takes the foolishness of the world in order to shame the wise. Now, these babes in context of Matthew 11 refer to all who are receptive to Jesus' teachings with childlike faith. There's their con connection between babes and children. It's childlike faith. Because with childlike faith also comes humility. And humility is necessary in order to truly understand your position and your opportunity to be able to make Jesus the Lord of your life. You know, Often the world looks down on those of us who have faith. They think faith makes us weak, but <laughs> it's actually the opposite. Uh, because it's when I'm weak, then, then I am strong because I've got God in me. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, this continues on the way that faith works. God's truth are revealed to those who are humble and open-hearted. This is contrasted to the wisdom of the self-righteous and the powerful. In order to receive the message, this teaching of Christ, we need to approach his teachings with a, a childlike spirit. You know, it's so important to be teachable. You know, it really is. I, I've been a pastor for over 20 years, and I've taught a number of different classes. And I've had people come to me, and they ask a question. If they have a teachable spirit, they receive my response or my direction uh, with an open heart. Uh, but there are some that are just not teachable. They want to argue. They it's very difficult for them, but you need to be humble. You need to have a childlike spirit in order to receive the things of God. You know, Jesus says this in verse 28 to 30. I want to spend some time on, on these, these uh, three, three verses. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean on me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden, my burden is light. You know, many scholars, many pastors that teach from this verse make a reference here that the burden that Jesus is referring to is, is the law. And I understand that. I understand that. You know, Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 23, he says, talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. They themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So I understand why some scholars take a look at the scripture and they say, well, this is referring to the Jewish law. In fact, there's a, uh, I, I read a little commentary by Adam Clark. Adam Clark was an amazing uh, Methodist, a uh, Wesleyan pastor, and he put it this way. He said, the ancient Jews commonly used the idea of a yoke that Jesus is talking about to express someone's obligation to God. There was the yoke of the kingdom, the yoke of the law, the yoke of the command, the yoke of repentance, the yoke of faith, and the yoke, general yoke of God. You know, basically, Jesus is saying this. He says, forget about all these other yokes. Just come to me. My yoke is light. My yoke is light. You know, I love that. However, I want to have a, another understanding, another possibility, and I think it's a strong possibility. But the thing is, is we are burdened, and we're burdened, but they were burdened then, and we're burdened today with sin. Jesus came for the remission of sin. That's why Jesus came. It wasn't so much about a different teaching. It was basically to rid ourselves of sin that was separating us from God. 
That's the yoke that's on our back right now with sin. And it's a burden for those that don't, haven't dealt with the sin problem. The sin, the Bible tells us, separates us from God. Uh, did you know also that sin separates us from each other? That's how burdensome this, this, this sin is. We lie, we cheat, we steal, we, we covet, we destroy. And that separates us not only from God, but also from our neighbor, because that's who we're stealing from. That's who we're lying to. Jesus tells us that we're burdened and our yoke is heavy. The more we try to throw off and throw off the burden, the more we realize the yoke is a very, very heavy burden. That's why Jesus says, come to me. And why does he say that? Why should we come? He says, all who labor and are heavy laden. They, these are people that are dealing with their sin problem. I will give you rest. You know, Jesus indeed is a yoke. It's an obligation. We give our complete life to Jesus. But it, at the same time, it's light. Jesus says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice that Jesus is basically telling us, as he's told us many, many times in the scriptures, that we have a choice. And that choice is continue doing what you're doing or make the choice to follow Jesus. As it is with babes that receive Christ, our role in salvation is basically approaching Jesus humbly, allowing Jesus to take us. We come to Jesus and Jesus receives us. Jesus receives us. The Bible says that all that receive him, he gives the right to become children of God. That's chapter 1 of John. And this is the message of the New Testament. Regardless of whether you're going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or the uh, apocalyptic books of, of, of Revelation, God is offering salvation, salvation to his people, and it's accomplished by coming to, to Jesus, which means we as individuals commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus. We take on his burden, his yoke. And Jesus says, my burden is light. That's why we come humbly. And if we come humbly, we're accepted. Jesus gives us the assurance. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And immediately added, he says, and the one who comes to me, I will no way turn away. You never have to worry about coming to Jesus and Jesus saying, no, forget it. Your sins are too great. I didn't die for you. Everybody else, but not you. No, no, that never. There's nobody that ever comes to Jesus and asks for forgiveness that he turns away. The sin condition, this heavy burden, is removed when we confess faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't happen through a creed, through a church, through, through baptism. It doesn't happen by joining a church roster, uh, church membership, any human means like that. It's simply humbling yourself and coming to Jesus. You know, Jesus declared, he said, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry. The one who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, this is a spiritual mystery that we have, that Jesus is more than enough. It's more than enough. It's not about the law. It's not about fulfilling the law. It's not about going to church. It's not about obeying the Ten Commandments. Not that we shouldn't, but it's really all about Jesus, believing in him, trusting in him, knowing that he died on the cross for you and that he's risen from the dead. You know, there are other biblical and religious terms for what I'm talking about. Uh, being born again, uh, fouling him, confessing him, receiving him. Those are all great theological terms that refer to the same thing. It's getting rid of the, the sin problem. That's, the, that's how we become truly free. You know, Jesus tells us we have a pre-existing condition. Uh, we're burdened. We are heavy laden. Now, this, this word, I'm not a Greek scholar by, by any stretch of the imagination, but I know how to look it up. Th this, this word that's growing, that weary or heavy laden is kopiahu. Kop kopiahu. I sound like Hawaiian instead of speaking Greek. Kopiahu. Uh, it implies working to the point of complete exhaustion. That's how burdened we are. The same Greek word was used to describe Jesus' fatigue. Uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was exhausted. He was completely growing weary. He was laboring. Now, we can also grow weary through, through modern religion, uh, through the exhausting labor of trying to, to please God. You know, there are still churches today uh, that follow a very, very strict legalistic approach to what it means to be a Christian. And God bless them, they're, they're just wrong. That's called legalism, and it's been around since the time of the early apostles. When we, when we try to um, appease God, 
or we feel somehow we're earning God's respect or earning our salvation through the law, we're going to fall short. You know, just as the Jewish people were never able to, to obey the law completely in order to, to, to live a, a righteous life. They, they were burdened by sin. That's why Jesus came. Um, let, let's finish up today by talking about repentance for a minute. This is one of the questions that comes up often when I'm speaking about Jesus um, and, and salvation is, is the idea of repentance. Now, repentance isn't mentioned in this text. However, this idea of coming to Jesus humbly and coming as a babe indicates this, this humility and repentance is, is goes part and, part and parcel. It's like this, it's the other side of a two-headed coin. You've got humility on one side and repentance on the other. Humility involves admitting that we as humans are inherently flawed and we need God's grace. We need God's help. Repentance aligns with this humility by acknowledging that we need a, a savior and we make a turnabout. We turn around. We turn from our wicked ways and we turn to Jesus. Not, not that we're going to be perfect, but we allow, we trust in him. And he cleans up our, our act. He starts giving us the things and giving us the ability to, to break our, our evil habits. Jesus says this. He says, um, I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Now, if you remember, the title of my message today is Jesus uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, offers true rest. Well, when does that true rest happen? Well, it really doesn't happen until we no longer have a, a sin nature. Now, will that happen? Well, yes, it will. The Bible clearly says that, that there will be a time when we are resurrected, we're given uh, new bodies, new bodies, and we no longer have a, a sin nature, that sin nature is left behind. And at that time, we have true rest because we have real unique fellowship with, with Jesus, with the, with the Trinity, with God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ. We have this uh, fellowship with one another and with them without a sin nature. And, and we get this basically from, from the Apostle Paul talking about this, this resurrection in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, 16 through 18, it says this. He says, For the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to, be, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, that's, that's the resurrection. That's the rest that Jesus brings. It's, that's what we are looking forward to. When we say, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, this is what we're looking forward to. And that, again, that was Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this verse, verse by the way, is referred to uh, by many of us evangelicals as the rapture of the church. Some people don't like using that term. I don't care what term you call it. Uh, that rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate because it was rap rapidimor, uh, which is where we get the word rapture. I don't care what you call it. It's the resurrection that happens. And it's at the end of time when Jesus comes in the clouds and we're caught up together to be with him in the clouds. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. That is when we find true rest. True rest. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we want to Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today.